Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. So my theme for today is something I hinted out yesterday. This is a paraphrase of a quote from Biku Analeo. He says, can you smile at the propensity of your mind uh, uh, to do the opposite of what you want to do? Um, I want to talk about that propensity and about how the Satipatthana Sutta, particularly through Analeo's uh, uh, presentation uh, can help us get to that kind of smiling state of mind, that state of acceptance and equanimity and compassion for others and self-compassion. And um, and I, I, I want to get to the way that we can accept that our minds are complex, that uh, there's more than one mind within us. And not only that, but that, as Suzuki Roshi said, being in big mind comes from accepting that we always exist in small mind. Uh, and that big mind exists along, a along with a struggling small mind, but that it's not just alongside that mind. It is actually lovingly enfolding that mind. And again, the, what I hope to be able to point to is a how, a, a, some steps that are, that for me seem remarkably easy to understand of how we can approach that in ways that, that can be helpful. At least they've been helpful for me. Um, first, I wanna read a couple of poems for sta stage setting, okay? So here's, of course, a very famous poem by Rumi, often, often cited or, or used in the um, in Buddhist tradition. It's called The Guest House. It has to do with small mind. The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And here's a poem that I, I first heard from Josh a few weeks ago during inquiry uh, the, by the uh, Scottish poet Norman McCaig. It's called An Ordinary Day. And it, to me, it has something to do with big mind. I took my mind a walk, or my mind took me a walk, whichever was the truth of it. The light glittered on the water, or the water glittered in the light. Cormorants stood on a tidal rock with their wings spread out, stopping no traffic. Various ducks shilly shally here and there on the shilly shallying water. An occasional gull yelped. Small flowers were doing their level best to bring to their curb bees like aerial charabanks. Long weeds in the clear water did Eastern dances and regarded by shoals of darning needles. A cow started to move, but thought better of it. And my feet took me home. And my mind observed to me, or I to it, how ordinary, extraordinary things are, or how extraordinary, ordinary things are, like the nature of the mind and the process of observing. That's just the best. I mean, they're both the best. <clears throat> okay, some more stage setting. Uh, I'm referring back to 
uh, participating with Kim in the uh, intensive back in January about the Sati Pratana Sutta as presented uh, by Bhikkhu Analayo in his book, Sati Pratana Meditation, A Practitioner's Guide. Um, the the Sati Pratana Sutta, as a recap here for those who participated and uh, a little bit of introduction for anyone who did not, starts with what I think is a very beautiful process of body scans, where we bring to the forefront of our mind things that we normally pay no attention to at all, such as the fact that we are covered in skin and uh, that we have bones and that we have flesh in between our bones and our skin and that we can hear and we can see and that we have all these perceptions that are available to us. So just as a stage setting scene uh, or scene setting step, let me suggest that um, you close for your eyes for just a minute and let me just, it, it'll just be a minute, but feel the skin on top of your head, at the very crown of your head. See if you can actually perceive that it's covered in skin and that it has feeling. And let the perception of that feeling kind of ooze down to the back of your neck, then to your forehead, to your eyelids, skin, to your nose, skin. Now all around your neck, from the back to the front, skin. See if you can have a perception of the feeling of the skin on your shoulders. And then both upper arms, both lower arms, the backs of your hands, the palms of your hands, and back up your arms to your torso. Feel the skin covering the expanse of your torso your chest, your abdomen. Feel the skin on your hips, on your legs, your, your thighs first, the inside of your thighs, the outside of your thighs, covered in skin. Skin that is sending you messages of perception every moment but that you mostly ignore because you can. The skin over your knees, the skin on the backs of your calves, the skin on the front of your, of your calves and your, your shins, the shin on the tops of your feet, on your ankles, on your heels, the skin on the soles of your feet, And then work your way up from the soles of your feet using your bones or feeling the bones that are there. You may have to flex something in, able to actually, in order to enable the perception of the bones. So feel them in your feet. So many complicated bones in your ankles, bones. Bones in your shins, two of them, although it's hard to perceive them as operating separately. Many bones in your knees that can twist and rotate and support you beautifully through a whole range of motion with your legs. A single strong bone in each of your thighs. It's right there. the bones of your hips that you're sitting on. You can probably feel those pressing against the cushion or the chair that you're sitting on. The bones of your spine connected to your hip 
bone and, and even a little tail that's coming down through the hips in, uh, at the base of the spine that we inherited from our ancestors. All these complex bones separated by cartilage. Bones in your shoulders that allow your arms to move. Bones that support your chest so that your breathing, the apparatus of your breathing can move in and out and that support your interior organs like your heart and your intestines, and your liver, and all these other important interior organs supported by and protected by bones. And then finally up the spine into your neck, flexing to hold this massive heavy object of your head up. And the bones of your skull, your teeth may be pressing together. The bones protecting your eyes and holding your brain on up to the very top of your head. I'll stop there and uh, just say that it, this is a very powerful experience for me to remember the things that I usually forget. And that that's one of the great virtues, I think, in the beginning of the Satipatthana is this very gentle, beautiful, utterly accessible way of, of connecting with, uh, connecting our bodies and our minds together. Uh, a crucial aspect of these body scans and other um, uh, meditations that then follow from them in the Satipatthana Sutta is that they are non-judgmental. You just feel. You, uh, and there may be judgments that come along with them. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we don't have to support those judgments. We don't have to run along with them. And that the, the, the great thing is that at least in the instructions that Manalayo gives, we're just noticing. And that gives a basis for everything that follows, I think. Uh, the meditations move to the breath and to other aspects of, of our physical bodies. Uh, and some of them are very judgmental. Um, for example, uh, we are encouraged in the Satipatthana Sutta in, uh, in something that Kim and I, in our presentation of it over the, over the intensive, chose to skip over completely. But in the Buddha's day, there was a, a strong emphasis on um, detaching from sensual pleasure, detaching from um, uh, attachment to the body uh, through hunger and sexual desire and so on, getting away from those. And so there's a lot of very judgmental uh, aspects to um, evoking disgust and uh, fear about the body in some of the Satipatthana Sutta. But again, we skipped over that, and I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, but um, the Buddha does talk about bodily fabrication when he's talking about the breath and being able to notice how we situate ourselves in space, the kind of proprioception that we have, an enteral perception that we have, and that those are fabrications. They're stories that we're telling ourselves about our experience and how we can notice and then not um, overly identify with bodily fabrications. So we calm, we recognize and we calm bodily fabrications. Um, and then on to the next uh, aspect of the Satipatthana, uh, which is feeling tones or what is called Vedanas. And this is something that I really, I spent a lot of time on during the, the weekend uh, that we were meeting in the intensive because they seem so, so uh, remarkable to me in um, the way that the Buddha saw into these, this uh, aspect of perception that, uh, pre, that, that comes before 
the words that we attach to perceptions that um, uh, um, we have a feeling tone that that something is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral and that comes first so we already have a judgment in our minds that comes from the body it comes from deep within our brains uh, and and our whole nervous systems about whether things are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And um, this, again, is, I think, remarkable that the Buddha had this psychological insight uh, at the time that he did. I, and I have, not, I have not seen it in other teachings from around that time. It, it may not have been something that he came up with on, on his own, but I can't find an antecedent thinker about it. Uh, on, a, on a side note, I want to say that what is presented as mental activity is, in fact, part of a physical process. Our brains are, are in fact, sloshing vats of electrochemical activity. And so in Buddha's brain, uh, Richard Hansen and his uh, co-author present uh, a description of neurochemicals that are active in influencing how we perceive things. And in particular, how we perceive things as pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And I, I wanna just read the, through this list real quick. He says, there are, uh, there, these are the major chemicals inside your brain that affect neural activity. They have many functions. And uh, we are listing here the ones that are relevant to this book. That is the book, Buddha's Brain. There's the primary neurotransmitters, which are glutamate. Glutamate is a substance that excites receiving uh, neurons, or neurons, not neutrons. And GABA, or GABA, which inhibits receiving neurons. And then there are neuromodulators, uh, also sometimes called neurotransmitters, that influence the primary neurotransmitters. Because they are released widely within the brain. They have a powerful effect. One is serotonin, which regulates mood, sleep, and digestion. Uh, most antidepressants aim at increasing the effects of serotonin. There's dopamine involved in with uh, uh, feelings of reward and attention. It promotes approach behaviors. There's norepinephrine, which alerts and arouses. Acetylcholine, it promotes wakefulness and learning. There are other substances called neuropeptides, um, which are different types of neuromodulators built from peptides, a particular kind of organic molecule. And included among those are opioids, which buffer stress, provide soothing and reduce pain, and produce pleasure. Uh, for example, a runner's high. These include what we call endorphins. There is a substance called oxytocin that promotes nurturing behaviors toward children and bonding in couples, associated with blissful closeness and love. There's vaso, I'm sorry, vasopressin, uh, which supports peer bonding. And then conversely, it can promote aggressiveness, particularly uh, among men towards sexual rivals. There's cortisol, which was released by the adrenal glands during the stress response. It stimulates the amygdala and inhibits the hippocampus. So it interferes with memory formation in the hippocampus. And there's estrogen. Uh, the brains of both men and women contain estrogen receptors, which affects libido, mood, and memory. So lots of different chemicals, all that act in complicated uh, uh, feedback loops with each other. And um, we spend a lot of, if you're like me, let me rephrase that. If you're like me, you may spend a lot of time wondering what's wrong with yourself and wondering uh, why do I choose to do the things I do? And began with this phrase from Analia, can I smile that my brain and my mind does things that I don't want it to do? Well, this is part of the answer that we have 
all these chemicals that are interacting with each other that are not in our control, that we can affect by taking certain actions, such as meditating. But we cannot really control them. And for this reason, I think we need to always be gentle with ourselves when addressing questions like, what's wrong with me? And there's an additional thing. I mentioned uh, that sensations can be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And the neutral ones are the ones that we find boring. And I would say that boring is a special kind of pain because in this whole feed, among these many feedback loops of, of chemicals, uh, we are, we have expectations. Like I'm going to go do a crossword puzzle and I'm going to, I'm going to get to the end of the crossword puzzle and I'm going to finish it all. But if we have a frustration that can produce, the, you know, we're, we're not getting the, the dopamine burst that we wanted to get from the, from that crossword puzzle. And the same thing happens with boredom. We're looking around for something to keep our mind happy, to keep it engaged, and we're not getting it. So it's a deficit of some sort of feedback loop of, loop of chemicals that again produces its own kind of discomfort, its own dukkha, as the Buddha would say. There's a, it's a peculiar fact also that we almost always make up stories to make sense of the experience that is generated by these chemicals. Um, so we notice Again, the, the Buddha noticing the feeling tones was a, a very powerful insight. And he also cautioned us against the story making process that we that we come up with ex post facto, as it were, to explain what our feelings are. And that's and that is one of the major tricks that our mind plays on us, that we that we lose sight of the fact that a lot of these stories um come along afterwards and that they fit our preconceptions one other thing is that as i mentioned before with with these chemicals and the kind of dissatisfactory quality of them is that our emotions come and go and the the supply of these chemicals ebbs and flows and we experience that, again, as a kind of a loss, as a kind of pain um, that is always with us. And that's what the Buddha, uh, I, I think that that is a, at least uh, a, a analog of what the Buddha was describing as the unsatisfactory quality of life, dukkha. And of course, dukkha can be everything from intense grief to the feeling like I have to adjust my toe because my sock is not feeling quite right right now, you know, very minor and yet nagging senses of um, the satisfactoriness that, that seem to require us to be moving all the time to adjusting to getting rid of unpleasant feelings. And one of the important parts of the Satipatthana Sutta meditation is to be able to watch feelings come and go and thoughts come and go and to, and to have a recognition of the transitory quality of thoughts and emotions. The third Satipatthana in the list is mind objects. And this is finally I'm getting into the, the point of my talk today. Uh, mind objects, and there are two sets of mind objects that are discussed in this part of the Satipatthana. The first one is poison, defilement, hindrance, other terms that, that uh, we soften now in our modern, more psychological age, but that in the Buddhist times were presented in pretty starkly. And these include uh, lust, anger, and delusion. That's the, the poisons at the beginning. Later on, there's contemplation of the seeds of enlightenment, seven different seeds of enlightenment. 
which are also available in our big mind. But um, what I want to focus on is the amazing way in which the contemplation of these poisons or hindrances is presented in the Sadi Um I'll just say that the, the these that these hindrances or poisons are related to the Vedanas, to the feeling tones that naturally arise within us. But you know, you can hear a harp or you can hear thrash metal. And I, I would say that that's the the sense that I get, that uh, the Vedanas are gentle hints at feeling and um, that what is being presented as the poisons are overwhelming uh, uh, bursts of feeling like like a you know a massive amplified guitar compared to a heart. So lust, anger, delusion. And so I want to find an Analyo quote here. Well, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I thought I'd pull it out. But what he says is, contemplate the presence of these poisons in your mind. See if you can find them. In the same way that you could find the sensation in your skin on the top of your head, see if without judgment, you can find the presence of lust or anger or delusion in your mind. And then there's a remarkable turn that the Buddha presents. And he says, contemplate the absence of these qualities in your mind. See if you can locate that they are missing or that there is a part of your mind where they are not present. Even if they are present in part of your mind, see if you can find a part of your mind where they are not present. And this is what really speaks to me. The focus on absence is an important turn in the Satipatthana meditation. Um, I, I, I'm trying to, I keep trying to come up with a, a slightly better metaphor for this, but imagine that you go out and you want to go into the forest and you're going to make a catalog of all the oak trees and the pine trees and the aspen trees. And that at some point you get the instruction, go out into the forest and see if you can find a place with no oak trees, no pine trees, and no aspen trees. Uh, Analayo says that finding that there are parts of your mind where you don't have lust or anger or delusion active can be in itself a, a pleasant state that you can use as a resource for, for uh, meeting other challenging thoughts. But it goes well beyond that, I think. Um, that the contemplation of absence points to, I think, uh, an analog of big mind in, in the metaphor that I was using. If you stop noticing only the three trees so that you could catalog them, you can begin to notice that there's a sky with clouds in it. There are stones and soil and moss and lichens. There's a tree flowing nearby. There's uh, decaying vegetation with new growth coming out of it all the everywhere you look. There are birds singing and insects buzzing and that you are in fact in an awe-inspiring ecosystem that has always been there while you were obsessively cataloging uh, the uh, few aspects that you were cataloging before. So again, this, is, this seems like an important pathway to opening to big mind to me. And it reminds me of the, of the phrase from Dogen, where he says to, uh, I'm paraphrasing here because I can't remember the exact words and I don't have the book open, but if you go out and you try and awaken yourself, that's delusion. But if you are actualized by the 10,000 things, if you become aware of 
and connected with the world around you, that is awakening. So I think that that is the analog of what is being pointed to in this opening to absence, opening to uh, awareness of potential beyond the, the points of focus that we normally give all our attention to. So let me ask you for a minute. Sit back and, and, and um, see if you can find any of the three poisons in your mind. Are they there? Can you see them without judging? Without judging yourself? Without judging those aspects of your personality that you might want to not look at too carefully? I, I certainly spend a lot of time in avoidance of that type of contemplation. Imagine the, each one of those poisons as a kind of a tree, an oak tree, a pine tree, an aspen tree. And then look around at the sky. Look at the soil under your feet. And imagine that everything else that's not one of those three trees has something to do with the openness of your mind to all of experience. I hope that image can help. Just be with that spaciousness for a minute. So I want to close by talking about something that I mentioned last night, which I've just started reading about recently. And um, curiously, a member of our Sangha, Ahsoka Richie Cuthbertson, uh, wrote about this last week on um, his blog uh, that I subscribe to. It's called the Default Mode Network. And just as we have chemicals in our brain that are part of our evolutionary history. We have structures in our brain that are part of our evolutionary history as well. And um, the default note mode network was discovered about 90 years ago when, when they were first exploring uh, nuclear magnetic resonance images of the brain uh, while, it, while certain activities were being undertaken. And what they discovered was a, a simple fact that different parts of the brain light up when we are engaged in a task. Um, what, you know, certain, certain areas of the brain light up uh, if we are concentrating on something or trying to do something. But that if we stop doing that and just sit in a restful way, that other areas of the brain light up. But what they found, what they have found over time is that that's typically not all that restful that the default mode network is involved in monitoring things with uh, anxiety, with fear. Uh, but I'm just talking not about trauma in this case, but again, more like dukkha, more like unsatisfactoriness, the, the sort of sense of monitoring, you know, is, is my toe going to start hurting pretty soon because I, I have this feeling in it, uh, am I, and do I have to worry about whether I'm going to have a fight with my cousin tomorrow, those sorts of things. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 uh, this network of parts of the brain, I, I have a slide that I was going to show, but I'm not going to put it up here. Um, but it, it, you know, gives an image of, of those part of where those parts uh, are spread around in the brain. But they, they mostly have to do with uh, uh, 
or not mostly what they have to do, but when, when rumination is occurring in our brains, when we are going over aspects of our past lives in, and making up stories about how they could have been different, if we are planning for the future and trying to figure out a way so that nothing bad can happen in the future, they tend to occur within the regions of the brain that are part of the default mode network. So why, do I, why am I talking about that? Because again, it's built into our heads. It's built into our nervous systems. Do you, do you ever, have you ever sat in meditation and thought, what is wrong with me? Why can't I stop thinking about this argument that I had with my sister 30 years ago? No? Do you ever have a thought like that? Unfortunately, I think about that kind of stuff all the time. Uh, and have you ever thought about how if you say just the right thing tomorrow, things will be better than they might be otherwise? Uh, when you're dealing with another person that you might have a conflict with. Um, I, um, I spent a lot of time doing that, particularly in work situations. Uh, and, and there's an endless supply of possibilities that can be run through. So these are very uh, engaging thoughts. And they're engaging because our brain is structured to produce them. No? So my point is, be gentle with yourself. If, these, if you are having ruminative thoughts, if you are obsessively planning, it's not your fault. You know, it's really not your fault. There are things you can do. And um, the biggest thing that you can do is to look around. Uh, to stop focusing on the trees and look at the ecosystem and be grateful for the ecosystem and to be compassionate to yourself and allow that compassion for yourself to open you to compassion for others and to connection with others. That's what we're doing here today. That's why we are sitting facing each other over the screen uh, as I'm doing that's why I'm here, because of the great benefit that I get from connecting with people who I know are compassionate, loving people, full of um, loving kindness. And finally, one way of, um, uh, I'm going to wrap up in just a second, but I want to ask Kim to describe what you were telling me earlier this week about a phrase that you learned from another teacher that you're working with, um, that I, I believe your first Dharma teacher, and the what to do if you feel like you've made a terrible mistake and you have to beat up on yourself. What's a phrase that you can use that help with that? Regret is a gentle oops. Regret is a gentle oops. So you don't have to take it all that seriously. You don't have to beat yourself up for years over something that you regret. You could just say, oops. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I, I love that, Kim. And that, thank you. I, I was so grateful that you were telling me about that earlier this week. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, Let me stop there. And thank you for your kind attention and uh, ask if there are any comments on what I was trying to present. Stephanie, hello. Hi, thank you, Joe. And um, I, I, yeah. I'll say, I, say El, I saw Ellen's hand and I'll call you next, so. so. Okay. I think what I, I, I wanna clarify. So Amalia was saying, you know, we can, we can also access this absence of this poison, these poisons. Uh -huh. it sounds almost like, not only from your analogy, but also from just further talking about it, that he's not actually talking about an absence, but more of a, um, 
more of a bigger picture like you know big mind holding little mind in other words so those poisons are always going to be there because we exist in this human body with these human minds and these human conditions they're always there but what it sounds like you're talking to us about is we have the opportunity to um kind of shift our focus from the poisons to the bigger picture is that right that's ex that's exactly what i was trying to say thank you for stating that so well but I, I i said something like that at the beginning that the big mind is not just alongside the little mind it is enfolding the little mind and is always there uh with us and that and you know it is transpersonal it is it's not something that we own it is mind that is an aspect of the universe that, as Dogen says, it's in the rocks and the trees and the and the roof tiles, you know, um, just as much as as it, as it is within us. And I, I think that's a that's a a powerful reminder that um, that it's always available, and that. It is as much as us, as any bad thing we've ever done, any strong emotion that may seem to sweep over us and, and, and do harm to ourselves and harm to others. Right. It, and, and we can access it. It's almost like, um, it's almost like this mind that is our default, especially if, if our conditioning is such that or tra our trauma is such that that's where we go to, the poisons. That's our default. And sitting zazen in this practice, at least to my way of thinking, is what helps us shift that focus from that default to hopefully an, a newer default that is right. kind of healthier, compassionate. Exactly. Exactly right. Thank you. I will add one thing, uh, which is, uh, this is something that uh, in Buddha's brain that Rick Hansen points to, is that we have other regions of our brain that we access literally when we are paying attention to bodily sensation without judgment. And that those regions of the brain are right next to the regions of the brain that light up when we're feeling compassion. And by directing blood flow toward the monitoring sensation in the moment without, um, without judgment, that we are actually stimulating the physical parts of our brain that make it possible for us to engage with compassion and to feel connection with others in a compassionate, loving, lovingly kind sort of way, you know? Uh, so we, you know, I, I was spending a lot of time talking about structures that we have in our brain that can, that can um, uh, give us trouble, but we have these other structures, which through meditation actually will help us out and give us the antidote to the poison, as it were. But the antidote to the poison begins with observation without judgment. So thank you so much for clearly stating that. So I'm going to call uh, Ellen and then Michael after that, okay? Ellen? Uh, yeah. Uh, I really love what Kim says, too, about um, regret just requires an oops. Uh, just There's just no need to be so hard on ourselves. Uh, just uh, notice it. And, uh, but I, I just wanted to say that doesn't mean we're not responsible. Uh, so, so if, if there, if we make an oops, you know, we, we may need to, there may need to be some repair. There may be something to learn there and so forth. But, uh, I just wanted to kind of add that little piece to it, but still it means a lot to me to, uh, <clears throat> 
as a person who's been really hard on myself a lot and continues to be uh, sometimes uh, the, to have a little self-compassion. That's all. Thank you. That's a crucial point, Ellen. We are responsible for our actions, but we don't have to stew in our thoughts. Right. Uh, Michael, I promised to call Michael next, and then Lisa, uh, Lisa Kuntz after. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, just uh, do two little examples. Uh, the first one based on the oops. Yesterday was the first time uh, I was the timer, and I made some mistakes. And because Kim had said that to me earlier, it wasn't a big deal. And usually I have to be so perfect and things have to go exactly the way I want them to. And when I had that attitude, whoops, everything was so different. The second example is I was driving on the way here yesterday and I was driving north on Mopac and there was a lot of traffic. And suddenly I noticed that the hillsides on both sides were full of blue bonnets and some orange flowers and some yellow flowers. And they filled me with such joy. They touched something in me that I no longer cared about the fact that there was traffic and people were being aggressive in their driving or whatever, whatever was going on for them. So that was an example of putting my mind on something else. And I've trained myself to do that because I've been a bird watcher for years and I see birds everywhere, but other people don't see them. And when I see them, they give me joy. And then the things that are going on around me lose some of their importance. So thank you. This is uh, John Tarrant uh, in describing the Buddha's awakening uh, uses a phrase that the Buddha, rem at the time he was giving up on trying to kill himself with privations uh, and decided to choose a middle path, it was because he remembered happiness from a time in his life that did not depend on getting what he wanted. So I, I'm guessing that what you what happened what came over you yesterday and and what happens when you see birds is happiness that doesn't depend on you know giving you something that you want although you may you know enjoy that in and of itself but that the opening to the potential for joy in the world again is available to us and if we can put down the self-centered dream long enough to to focus on it or to, to open to it. Thank you for that description. Lisa Kay. Um, yeah, I've got a big lag here out of sync. Oh, so um, your example of the trees and the forests, and it was so concrete, I could visualize it. You know, going into uh, a forest and identifying trees, and then going into the same forest or any forest and experiencing experiencing the absence of a particular tree. Um, it is so concrete and it describes so much what I'm, something I'm ruminating on. Okay, it's I've been ruminating on it for a few years. <laughs> And every once in a while, uh, I keep changing my story. I mean, this is the important part. So the tree, the rumination, the thing I'm not very unhappy and frustrated with is the tree. And I keep changing stories about this tree in a way. It's like, um, it's like one, you know, sometimes I chop the tree down, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to burn it up or I'm going to prune it a little. You know, those are the stories and then everything will be better. Or, you know, the season will change. It'll drop its leaves and, you know, then it'll be a different tree. It'll be just a little pain maybe. It won't 
be a full-fledged tree. Um, so what I'm noticing is every once in a while, <coughs> I, have I have the absence. I kind of pop out of my rumination <laughs> into this different space of happiness. So why I'm laughing is that makes me feel uncomfortable. It's like I pop out into this openness and experience it and feel joyful. And then something in me feels guilty or negligent. I mean, I'm Velcroed on to the three emanations and stories. <coughs> and this really slow process, you know, that you gave us of um, working with absence and how different that is, that experientially that is in my body. You know, when I get like catapulted out of that rumination, um, there's space, there's space. But I do have a feeling and I love that space. So that could be, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on there and you explained it and explicated it beautifully. It's like, um, yeah, yeah, that's great. A great teaching. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Again, many thanks. <laughs>